Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios here in Istanbul. On today's program, we'll be dancing with witches and exploring social revolutions as seen through the eyes of artists. And we'll also visit a stone masonry mosque in Turkey's Black Sea region that stands out in the most unique of ways. But first... Qatar celebrates another successful film festival with female filmmakers dominating this edition's lineup. Adventurous international works mixed with modern British classics at London's prestigious art fair. Group displays, curated spaces, photography exhibitions and prints galore. The 2019 London Art Fair is once again bringing its usual flair to the UK capital. As the first major art event of the year, the fair is setting a defiant tone in the face of Britain's political woes, showcasing the best in sculpture, photography, as well as painting. Showcase's Miranda Addy brings us her selection of what should not be missed. From a high enough vantage point, it's possible to appreciate the scale of the artworks on display at the London Art Fair. Running from the 16th to the 20th of January, metal sculptures, clashing colour prints and stylish chandeliers are all taking centre stage this year. Over our history, the fair has evolved to become a much more contemporary affair, so we now have 130 galleries, um, but 15 countries represented from all corners of the globe. They include Canada, Russia, South Korea and Puerto Rico. A dozen galleries, half from Latin America, the other half from Europe, collaborated as part of the Dialogues section. Curated by Kiki Mazzuccelli, it's part of the Fair's Art Projects section, which spotlights international artists. At my back, you can see the work of Sergio's sister, uh, who's an artist who is in, is in his 70s. And on this side is the work of Anna Mazze, who's in her mid-30s. And uh, the idea here is that both artists work with this language of geometric abstraction, which is one of the main, kind of, one of the most important trends in, in Brazilian art history. Venezuelan artist Augusto Vialba's work layers paint to create unique textures. This is about materials I've found and put it together and working with colors and transparency and different material. They are basically on paper and I do this process and I finish it on canvas, which is, feels like it's leather or kind of different um, point of view, like looking at art. The London Art Fair has kicked off the international art calendar every year since it launched in 1989. But this year, the calibre of work for sale is particularly high, with works by Banksy, David Hockney and Grayson Perry, all up for grabs. 2018 was an especially good year for David Hockney. The English painter's work, titled Pool with Two Figures, sold for $80 million last November, nearly four times the price of anything he sold in the past. Part of what the fair has always been known for is we are very responsive and reactive to what's happening in the market and wanting to be reflective of those trends and peaks. So we have three galleries actually showing David Hockney at the fair. But in addition to high-end work, the London Art Fair is also focused on affordable pieces, with a particular emphasis this year on printmaking. And although items here may be for sale, it doesn't feel like a market. Robert Upstone collaborated with Vigo Gallery to curate a solo exhibition of husband and wife team Emma Biggs and Matthew Collings, who operate as a single artist. Their Isnik style diamond shapes play with ideas of geometry and repetition. People will always be interested in beautiful things that mean something to them and which actually operate on a different level or on a more 
elevated level than the day-to-day -day hurly burly of, of, of political conflict. And many of these things um, are affordable. They're, they're, they're not just a remit of millionaires, they can be afforded by, by ordinary people. The London Art Fair offers the perfect blend of that, from the priceless to the surprisingly affordable, with pieces for a seasoned collector and those new to the game. And crucially, turnout's been busy, a promising start to the 2019 artistic calendar. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. Now to continue this conversation, we're joined by Jean Wainwright in our London studio. Jean is a professor of contemporary art and photography. Jean, the museum partner this year is the Towner Art Gallery. What, what can people expect to see from them? Well, it's very interesting. This fair has, as you indeed say, collaborated with the Towner Art Gallery, and they brought this wonderful survey of work. I, I loved seeing it. And three works struck me. The first one, the Eric Revillius. Um, it's a small work. It's, it's a room, and you look at it. It's got beautiful wallpaper in it. Now, it's an empty room. And, of course, we talk about each image tells a story. And this work was made by Revillius when he went to Le Havre just before the beginning of the war, and he got stuck there for a while due to inclement weather. And he made this portrait of the room, which was later destroyed by a bomb. But why I love it is the wallpaper also relates to the wallpaper that's sitting on in the exhibition, specially commissioned by by the Towner, which is done by Becky Beasley. She's picked out some details in this 1939 image to portray on the wall. And then another work that I think really shows us some of the wealth and breadth of the collection is William Gear. And this is an abstract painting. And of course, as I say, every painting tells a story. So this abstract painting with its oranges and blacks shines out of the wall, although it's quite understated. But it caused a little bit of controversy at the time, not because of the subject matter. Well, because William Gear was a curator at the time at the Towner when he acquired the work, his own work, and he kept writing off to muse uh, quite writing off to foundations to ask for kind of funds to acquire abstract art and built up a lovely collection for the Towner, but also acquired quite a few of his own works at the time. And questions began to be asked, but thank goodness that he did do it because we've got these wonderful examples of British 50s and 60s abstraction. Now, Jean, photography plays a central role in this year's art fair, including a special presentation of Photo 50, which has become a feature of the fair, and uh, this year's focus is on family. What can you tell us about the 14 selected photos? Well, again, everybody has a family, and of course the family album or family pictures is so important to people's lives, and increasingly so with, with all the amazing digital photography we've got. But what the curator has done, whose family are we looking at now? He's really looked at different practices of photographers and how they've related to the family. So there are unexpected moments. Firstly, uh, one of the works, Large uh, Portraits of uh, Families by Trish Morrissey, and they're photographed on beaches. And you know on beaches how sometimes people set out their little territories, you know, which, you know, with their beach towels and their windbreaks and their umbrellas. And so what she's done is, that's what it looks like when you first see it see the works and then you think hmm something strange there well what the artist has done she has approached family she had a bag of clothes on her back and she basically dressed up seeing these random families on the beach dressed up so she looked like them either in bikini or frocks or whatever they were kind of wearing and then she approached them and said can I take your photograph with a large format photo for uh, camera, actually. And uh, they would agree or not, usually agreed. And then she said, well, what I want to do is I want to replace the mother in the work. I want to be the mother in the portrait. And so the mother would be removed from the portrait and would be asked to take the photograph. Now, sometimes the father or man in the group would volunteer to take the photograph. She said, no, no, I, I need the mother in it. But it's also about far more than that, about family groups, 
groups about different beaches in the UK and Australia, different territories, different groupings, social economic groupings of people. So, Jean, now we've touched upon family and also in this year's uh, fair, themes of, uh, you know, national and cultural identity are also prevalent. Why is it important for the fair to represent what we're dealing with in today's, uh, today's world? Well, of course, when you walk round a fair like this, works can't help but jump out at you. You know, suddenly read works differently because of political situations that are happening, certainly in Britain at, at the point with Brexit. You know, Til Tillmans, for example, that I mentioned earlier, a huge fan of remaining and has done many works about that. So you walk round, you see works that seem to express something of the moment. And this show, which of course has many galleries in it, each of them showing work, international works, works full of colour and expression. That's what art does. It reflects the times and it reflects so many different mediums and so many different types of work all together, like a society kind of existing together, which I think is wonderful <laughs> and, and glorious and what art should do. And so these fairs kind of give us a feeling of what's happening now and also work from the past. Right, great. Thanks for your time, Jean. Really appreciate the insight. From Hollywood to Bollywood, the hashtag MeToo movement has been shaking up the global entertainment industry. But in the oil-rich state of Qatar, more than 60% of all emerging filmmakers are women. And as the doors close to the annual Ajial Film Festival, we take a look at one fast-rising star of Qatari cinema. Although not as globally renowned as Dubai, the tiny energy-rich state of Qatar is looking to step out of the shadows of its more popular neighbours. One way it looks to achieve this is by building on its progressive reputation. Set to host the 2022 World Cup, Qatar is hoping to use that global platform to show off its other talents. What if the kids at school think I'm strange? Organised by the Doha Film Institute, the selected films touched on varying topics, such as relationships, family, and some on the country's history. But it was the female directors that dominated the festival. The idea that we have more women in filmmaking here in Doha than, uh, than men, of course, we value everyone's participation. And I think we've been really lucky for, from the beginning of the industry and when we first opened doors for people to tell the stories, we didn't discriminate against anything, uh, including gender. Award-winning director Amal Al-Mufta initially had to convince her family that a career in the arts was for her. She knew it was her calling after she received national recognition with her film Al-Hamali. It's a documentary about the life of an Al-Hamali, a porter who assists shoppers at Qatar's most visited market, Souk Waqif. <laughs> Mufta feels that the film industry in Qatar has been more supportive, rather than segregated, making it stand out against others around the world. I know that uh, from the outside it seems that there's like a segregation especially like in the Hollywood industry between men and women and how women operate there. But here, really, I feel like uh, it's, a, it's a leveled field, like uh, whether you're a woman or a man, you are treated the same. Mufta also understands that progress will take time, but her desire to demystify perceptions of Qatari women is something she feels she has the responsibility to see through. The community um, of women in Doha, uh, especially in this society, is very private. And I just feel like as women filmmakers, we have access to that community and to so many different stories and tales that uh, are unique to, to, to us here.
With Doha increasing its profile as a global media hub, up-and-coming filmmakers like Mufta are looking to tap into the Gulf's region's diversity to show her country in a different light. Still to come on Showcase, making art and culture more accessible. An exhibition experience independent of time and space on the symbolic power of womanhood and witchcraft. But before we bring you those stories, here are a few other arts and culture stories making headlines. <laughs> Not that anyone needs encouragement to turn the camera on themselves, but Museum Selfie Day is still being celebrated the world over. In Turkey, more than 300 art institutions and ancient sites are playing host to arts-minded selfie aficionados, with people sharing their pics using the hashtag Museum Selfie Day. The hashtag holiday became popular after Jay-Z and Beyonce shared their selfies at the Louvre Museum in Paris. Following a wave of sexual harassment allegations against American singer and songwriter R. Kelly, protesters gathered outside Sony Music's headquarters in New York. As part of a movement dubbed Hashtag Mute R. Kelly, they are demanding RCA Records drop him and stop profiting from his work. The rally came less than a week after a plane flying a banner which read Drop Sexual Predator R. Kelly was flown over Sony Music's offices. Brazil's National Museum has been rebuilding its massive collection after a blaze destroyed most of its 20 million items last November. The 200-year-old institution, considered the most important natural history museum in Latin America, was world famous for its paleontology department. So it's fitting that the first exhibition to be held since then, titled When Not Everything Was Ice, features 160 rare Antarctic fossils. While art and culture may be universal, not everyone has access to it. 15% of the world's population experiences some form of disability, but an initiative called Museum Without Walls is hoping to create an exhibition experience that anyone with access to the internet can enjoy. Bringing together a selection of visual artwork curated by Mine Kaplanji, Dancing with Witches is the third exhibition from Museum Without Walls. It draws inspiration from works that center around the theme of women's rights and equality, particularly in English literature. In Dancing with Witches, Grace and Perry's paintings appear alongside William Blake's poetry and also features contemporary Turkish artists like Pinar Yolajan, as well as Janan and Erinj Seyman. Now to discuss this further, I'm joined by Ryan Nelson and Sue Basbu with the British Council. Now, Sue, thanks for joining us. Sue, how would you describe Museum Without Walls? Uh, what's the Council's aim for this project? Uh, the Council, in general, globally aims uh, and thinks that art should be for everyone and should be accessible for, uh, by anyone. Uh, we have a huge collection of artwork, the British Council collection, and we wanted to showcase it more internationally and in Turkey as well. We had a a very successful exhibition back in 2015 of Grayson Perry in Istanbul at the Perry Museum and at Jar Modern in Ankara. It was a success and we really felt that we should do more with the collection and we should showcase it more in Turkey. It was very well received. So we started to think of ways of showcasing the collection. And since the digital is a tool that you know help everyone uh, extend their network and reach wider audiences, we started thinking about developing an online platform that would help us, enable us showcasing the collection. Uh, why is accessibility so important? Well, I think when we're talking about the digital, it's actually at a really exciting time. Um, with the world becoming more and more digital every day, it's not really an option anymore for arts organizations who have these really rich, massive collections to actually not make them available. It's becoming more and more critical to actually how they operate and sort of continue to be successful. So we know from a recent report by the um, 
Istanbul uh, Foundation for Culture and Arts that actually almost every arts institution in Turkey wants to put digital uh, and accessibility at the core of their comm strategies. And we know from research in the UK that it's exactly the same. So what's really exciting about something like um, Museum Without Walls is that it shows the commitment of the major sort of arts institutions, cultural sectors, the British Council, to actually make art available to new audiences who might not feel comfortable going into a gallery space, who might not sort of be aware of what's actually available. So digital kind of gives us this opportunity to reach vast numbers of new audiences. One might not be feel comfortable with dancing with witches. Tell us about that theme. So this is a theme uh, this year was around uh, women and was really to look at how often in a lot of our collections female artists are overlooked, female subject matter. So the general open call was around the theme of women. Um, and our curator this year sort of was really interested in this symbol of, um, of, of the witch and how it's actually been used throughout history as a symbol for female power, um, for a lot of really exciting, interesting work around the importance of nature. So it's a really useful lens and window into a, a lot of bigger uh, conversation topics. Now, now, Ryan, you just moderated a panel, Digital in the Art Space. How, can, uh, how do you think digital can be used as a new space for art? So I think one of the challenges when you're talking about digital in this way is a lot of people think it's a magic wand that's going to solve all of your problems, that it's, you know, it's really easy to do. And so I think organizations need to be really aware of what digital can and can't do in this space. And for us as the British Council, we approach this through a lens of uh, different but equal. So we're not looking to replicate uh, or replace the real world arts experience. We still think that going to the theater or an exhibition, or listening to a concert live can be a magical, life-changing experience. Right. But what we do with moving the work into the digital space is uh, look at how it can be adapted and changed and actually you can create something new that's not lesser but is uh, different but equal. Okay. Uh, have you begun thinking, I know we just started, launched this uh, edition, but have you started thinking about next year's uh, Museum Without Walls? Yeah, actually we, we are. We, we, we have started thinking and yeah, next year I can say that it won't be only with a, uh, done with a Turkish creator, but we will open uh, the we will have the open call in more international way, uh, maybe in the UK, maybe in another country, and we'll have one exhibition by three, three or four curators, international curators. Ryan, you're telling me something interesting about how many pieces the British Council has, and also what's unique about this year is the first time you've used Turkish artists? Yeah, that's right. So the reason why we're really excited about this project is the British Council holds a large arts collection of about 8,500 works of British arts and artworks from the 20th century. Um, but we are an organization without a sort of public venue, we're not a museum or a gallery. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those works get loaned to museums around the world, they get seen in exhibitions, but that's maybe one or two works traveling out. And so it means that most of the time, 80, 90% of our collection is actually in storage. So the reason why a project like this is really exciting is it allows us to sort of really showcase that when this is something that actually should be for the benefit of everyone. And what we added this year to the project, which was really exciting for me, is previous incarnations looked just at those artworks in the British Council collection. Mm -hmm. But for this year, for the first time, we actually showcased the work of Turkish artists alongside. And that led to some really interesting conversations and just relationships between those artworks. It brought a sort of um, mutual element to it. So as the British Council, a lot of our work is about that two-way relationship between the UK and other countries. So I was really pleased that actually the exhibition managed to do that this year. Ryan, Sue, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. But before we wrap up, let's head to Northeastern Turkey to see a stunning piece of architecture. It was built in modern times, but reflects the uniqueness of traditional Turkish woodwork techniques. I'm Adha Halim. Thanks for watching, and bye for now.